What's going on guys? It's K-Dub here with another episode of Crypto Zombie. Today I have David Brierly, the founder and chief initiator at Howdo. How's it going, David? Very well, thanks. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on the channel today. So um, for everybody who doesn't know exactly who you are, why don't you just give us a little bit about your background and just tell us who you are exactly? Yeah, sure. So um, I've been in technology for the last 20 years um, and held senior leadership positions in the last I don't know, uh, 12, 13 years. Um, large and small organizations like SAP or, or ClickTech, um, predominantly in the EMEA and the Asia Pacific areas. So building up teams, uh, bringing innovative products to market and, and mass scale. We're here to talk about how do. Elevator pitch. Yes. Elevator pitch for anybody out there who wants to know what exactly is Howdo. Okay, so Howdo is a, a social and influencer platform with a little bit of a twist. You know, we're developing our own social layer on top of the public blockchain where other third parties that require mass and also a social layer could deploy their own um, dApps. For example, what are what are some of the problems that you've seen with traditional social media platforms and exactly what are you guys doing to address these issues? So uh, I would say there's, there's, there's two key areas, and that is exploitation um, and, and the uh, one-dimensionality of, of these applications. I mean, we don't have to go into too much detail with regards to um, the issues with um, large organizations like Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, etc. But ultimately, for far too long, um, users um, that have been producing this content um, have not been receiving any compensation for that and these centrally controlled organizations have been um, making huge amounts of money off the back of others. Um, from the usage standpoint, you know, there's a plethora of different apps. Um, so if you want a social experience, you know, you have to jump between different apps because different apps do different things. Um, and you know, we at How Do, you know, really viewed those two issues as, as something that, um, you know, we could bring an application and a platform to market that could address. So what was it exactly about blockchain that you found was the driving force? Like, what do you think, what are the advantages of blockchain over, like, you know, just like you've said, a centralized uh, system, in your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, 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 the big play is it's decentralized. So uh, ultimately, there's no one single entity that's got control of that environment. Um, and with social networks, as, as we all know, there's lots of data and personal data um, moving to and throw between different um, entities or, or, or users. So um, what we um, are developing is the ability that those three constituent parts, you know, be it users or content creators or advertisers, by utilizing, not everything's on the blockchain, by the way, but, um, you know, whenever the users, the content creators or the advertisers need to track something and then to use it at a later date, that's when we will be storing um, certain metadata within the blockchain. Um, to enable them to have control over what has happened. Uh, from a user, it could be that they, they personally want to track um, certain um, things that they do on their social network, and then they can choose whether or not they want to share that information with advertisers. It's their choice. Um, with content creators, the same. Uh, we want them to be able to increase the way that they can monetize. Um, now, you know, when it comes to transactions, you need the blockchain to be able to um, uh, um, manage that process. And then with the advertisers, you know, it's all about uh, reducing frauds and uh, making sure that the fake views are reduced, etc. So um, within our platform, um, it's not solely um, going to be deployed on top of um, the blockchain. Elements of it will be, you know, um, off chain uh, and then certain elements will be on chain to provide a decentralized environment um, that pr really provides more, more um, control to those users, content creators and advertisers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a that's a great use for blockchain. Um, I do like those real world applications and we've already seen it working with some other platforms as well. I mean, now you do have some competitors in the space. You have to be just honest about that. I mean, we do have Steemit, Narratives coming out over on Neo. We have ONG Social. So I guess my question to you is what do you think exactly separates you from the competition? What makes you guys unique in that sense? Yeah, sure. Um, and you know, they're all great companies. I, I would say, from from my standpoint, I don't see any other um, uh, um, 
startup that is actually launching their own public blockchain that is going to be optimized for mass scale um, with a social layer. So, and I think that's the slight difference that we've got when you talk about things like Steemit. And, um, you know, Steam has done a fantastic job of proving that you that content creators can monetize, but it, it's very one dimensional. It's a blogging site. Um, you know, I view it as the granddaddy. You know, it um, it broke it broke the mold. It made everyone realize that what you could achieve. So we're taking it one step further. But then when you when you add in the uh, the ability for other um, third parties that need to take advantage of a very highly scalable public blockchain as well as a social layer built in. Um, I don't see that there's any other viable um, solution currently than how do. Well, as, as far as scalability is concerned, the last time that we had spoke, you were initially planning on utilizing the Ethereum blockchain, but now you guys have recently had a little bit of a change in the direction that you're going. So do you want to explain what, what the new plan of action is now and why you chose that exactly? Yeah, sure. So in our original white paper, when we launched, uh, at the very end, we did say that um, if we ever felt that the Ethereum blockchain could not scale to the requirements of our um, social layer, um, then we would we would you know swap it out in essence. Um, however, we were always developing our own decentralized um, environment for uh, encrypted data storage, for messaging, um, for streaming, etc. Um, and then when when my development team just started um, investigating more, you know, we we realized that you know one of the big issues the whole crypto industry has got and that is that we all want to go mainstream but in order to go mainstream we need to make sure the user experience is as comparable as the current solutions everyone's using yeah it's you know us you know crypto fans may be prepared to use a solution that is a little bit clunky but it's you know it's on the blockchain and we accept that but the masses aren't going to accept that so it was more of a realization um, and then we just started investigating so okay so um we can't use ethereum because of the the major issues with scalability you know yeah um if you actually just think about it i think one of the one of the biggest elephants in the room um is that there are thousands you know okay hundreds you know slightly over a thousand dApps that, of course, predominantly have said they're building on top of Ethereum. Um, Ethereum is struggling already, even with the advancements that um, the community is talking about in the future, uh, even with the kind of the um, uh, goal of trying to get up to the TPS of, of Visa. Mm -hmm. OK, um, but if you actually break that down, even if you manage to get your blockchain around the let's say 50,000 TPS it won't make a dent into the user experience that the masses expect I and mean, if you just look at um, things like Facebook YouTube you know Facebook and YouTube you know have more than a million TPS yeah uh, uh, WhatsApp has more than 800,000 TPS so that so we all need to wake up and smell the coffee um, if we are going to deploy a a solution that is going to utilize the blockchain, we have to make sure our infrastructure is reliable and stable and scales with low latency that the average user outside of our industry is going to accept and use. So from that, we, we did lots of bench, you know, benchmarking and testing, went through all different um, in blockchains, and we felt that in the end, the uh, the one you know, code base that really ticked off numerous boxes was EOS, mm -hmm. um, and and I'll run through you know the reasons why. You know, one, it is um, a, a platform that has phenomenal depth in its community base. Yeah, so we actually saw that, didn't we? Was it last week that um, there was a, a so-called um, security flaw in the code. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the the community was quick to react. Um, they fixed it, and ultimately, that's what you need because we all know that there's always holes in code. Um, so that was one of the big things. The other one was um, zero fees on the network. Um, if if you are you know, really wanted to drive something, especially like social um, or anything to do with people interacting, you have to understand that people aren't going to pay for that. Yep. So 
that's Ethereum out the window uh, as it stands already, you know. Um, and then it's then it comes down to things like massive scale. Um, the only viable option that we believed, we talk about public blockchains now. We're not not talking about private, etc. But public blockchains was the the notion of parallelization, you know, parallel computing, you know, multi-thread. Which um, I'm not I'm not a hardcore developer myself, but you know, um, the whole notion behind multi-thread computing has been around for years, and it's quite interesting that. Whilst um, we the blockchain is very innovative, um, no one before really EOS has thought about uh, enabling it to take advantage of multi-threading. Now we all know you can only scale, massively scale, if you incorporate that. So um, EOS is the only one that's, in our opinion, um, that has come out and, and actually shown a route to that. And uh, we ourselves have employed you know, a couple of um, experts in this field. Um, and that was also one of the reasons why we decided that um, yeah, we had to fork EOS and then um, customize it for our own usage. Right. So that's actually a really key point there is you're not you're not even going to be on EOS. You're actually forking EOS. And then so how exactly are you going to customize it? What, what are you going to what, what is what is your plan after you fork it? How do you plan on customizing it to suit your needs? Sure, sure. So again, we come back to the you know the, the main focus is is delivering a user experience that the masses are going to enjoy. We're talking about sub second you know response times. Um, the only way you can do that is if 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 you have an environment that you can trust. Now uh, the you know EOS ultimately is going to become a public blockchain. Uh, there's not going to be any or too many controls over what kind of DApps are, are launched. Um, so they they can't guarantee uh, like an SLA on um, on network bandwidth, etc., because it is a public blockchain. Um, so one of the reasons why we were forking is because we want to have an environment that that we can trust, um, and the the super nodes that will come on and, and help us run that will have to adhere to a certain level, and that level most probably will be higher than than um, you know other master nodes, uh, and because we have to protect the integrity, you know we have to make sure that the it scales and it's responsive. Um, so that's that was really the kind of big picture as to why we um, did decided that we had to fork. But then you get into the customization. So there's little things that we you know we're going to do. Um, we're going to slightly make the process of the 21 super nodes more democratic. So, you know, we're looking at having a pool of 100. We're still going with the consensus, uh, you know, number of 21. Um, but we're going to automatically, uh, subject to them but there being enough of these, uh, of the actual super nodes, but rotate them. After three three um, cycles, they'll be rotated, 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 rotated. So it's a slight tweak. It does make it more democratic uh, because under the current um, system, it all comes down to simply votes, right? Um, and lots of people have made, you know, the, uh, basically brought it to people's uh, you know, attention that, um, you know, if it's simply down to votes, it can be manipulated. Whereas by us tweaking it, it will come down to votes to get into the into the hundred pool. But then basically, y you will be rotated, so it will give everyone a, more of a fair chance, make it more um, uh, equal for everyone. Is it kind of uh, is it going to be like cyclical, like, or is it going to be a uh, is it random? How does that work? Like, yeah, so so we, we, uh, we're looking at a, a random. So basically, okay, cool. It, it, yeah, this, the system will just pick another twenty-one. Okay, three cycles, another twenty-one, um, and then we're also bringing in a notion which we um, call the proof of trust, um, and the proof of trust is just a layer on top that really just monitors the reliability of the super node. And how trustworthy they are, and that score will go into the algorithm, but also um, mean whether they qualify or they have been disqualified as one of the hundred pool in in the super nodes. So again, we we are we're trying to balance um, the uh, the democratic nature of a decentralized public blockchain, but also with the realization that you must make sure and maintain. Um, the scale and the integrity of the network in order to deliver a user experience 
that users are going to want to use. Otherwise, right. it's what's the point? I mean, no one's going to use it, and we may always go home. It, exactly. I, I have to be honest as well. I mean, I don't want to name any names, but you know, every time a new app comes out, a decentralized app, whatever, I try it, and there always set, tends to be that 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 thing that just falls short. And like you said, the average everyday user, I mean, we're in the space, but what, we represent what, 1%, less than 1%? You know, these people, yeah. they're using their Instagrams, their Snapchats, their, their Facebooks, you know what I mean? They need to really have that user, that seamless user experience that makes it, they don't even know they're on a blockchain. It's just like exactly. any other app. And it, um, it, no, yeah. Exactly, but, yeah, but, you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I always say, you know, users, users don't buy technology they buy experiences. You just have to look at, um, you know, Apple. Um, from a technology standpoint, I mean, Samsung has been way advanced <laughs> in Apple for a long time, yeah? yeah. But, um, you yeah, know, why is Apple so dominant? Because they sell the experience. And I think that for us to really take the innovative um, value proposition of blockchain to the masses, we have to blend the two, mm -hmm. yeah? User experience with the blockchain and you know and and again like like you i i you know i sometimes you know i was at consensus you know you were there as well a couple of weeks ago and i i was talking to one person i'm not going to name any names and they said oh just, we just raised um 40 million us dollars so i was talking about their value prop and i i had anchor my head of blockchain development and afterwards he just said it's never going to work <laughs> yeah it's you know it's, it's it david are you it's not going to work. And I said, well, yeah, unfortunately, there's too many of those. I mean, you could you could name them. I mean, there was one last year that raised huge amounts of money in relation to you know uh, a messaging app. And it's like, well, it's not going to work because a messaging app to become viable, mm -hmm. you have to be talking tens and tens of millions of users. Yeah. If it's on Ethereum, well, it's not going to work. Right. You're going to do 12 things per second. So uh, again, we um, I think with my background of being in software um, and uh, you know we, 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 we are trying to marry best of you know best practice, best of breed really by saying well you know um, we're not just going to be um, selling ourselves on hype. You know we are actually trying to deliver something that we honestly believe can be used outside of our crypto world. Yeah, actually, I'll be I'll be honest with you. That was half the reason why I wanted to sit down and chat with you because you weren't hyping this up at all. In fact, I had spoke to you months ago and you were like, no, we're not doing the marketing. We're not doing the promoting. We need to get this thing figured out. We need to get it so that the user experience is, is up to our level, you know, and I, that's yeah. some, that's, I do appreciate that as well. So, yeah, no, no, we appreciate that. And then the last point, you know, we're tweaking is this whole thing about multi-threading. You know, it's uh, EOS has, has declared that they will start working on on this part of, of EOS. They've made it ready in a, from the code base standpoint. But we've actually, you know, um, you know brought on a couple of specialists and we're going to see if we can optimize that as well, because that's really uh, the holy grail. Whoever unlocks that really then enables your application to go mainstream. You know, it's it's. It's the uh, the AI war, you know. It's uh, you know whatever you want to call it, you know the the power struggle, whatever yeah whatever you know, you want to call it. The reality is whoever unlocks that, you know, really enables them to take this mainstream, and and that's also it makes me laugh when you know there's there's certain you know, blockchain um, uh, organisations out there which are you know saying like you know you know we you know we believe that we will be able to deliver, I don't know. 15,000 TPS or 20,000 TPS, it's like, guys, that's not going to make a dent. It doesn't, you, you might as well do 1,000 <laughs> yeah. TPS because 20,000, even 50,000 is not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Well, not not for what you guys are doing. There, there are some businesses and enterprise applications where you can use that, but definitely not for social. Not for yeah, social, I, yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, I, yeah, I need to apologize for, for <laughs> blockchain companies out there. I don't mean everyone. Yeah, but yeah the, the, the use case... Um, where you know you are, um, have, you're looking for, uh, you know, end user intimacy. Yeah, I mean, mass scale intimacy. You know, we call it social. You know, um, but but anywhere where there's high frequency activities, um, that's really you know where you need mass, and that's where you need multi-thread um, blockchains. 
Exactly. And what I actually appreciate about your approach to it is the fact that you see, you talk to some people and they're focused only on the, like the bottom of the stack. That's all they care about. You talk to other people and then they're just only focused on the, the user experience layer, but they're not meeting in the middle. They're not finding that marriage between the tech and the user experience. And it's really yep. nice to see that you guys understand that it has to work on the back end, but at the same time, like I want to look at something pretty and it needs to load when I want to use it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. that's, yeah. and, and uh, yeah, we talked about the nodes. That's awesome. So they're basically going to be like uh, essentially master nodes in, in a way that is that you would, uh, is it a, a proof of stake type, a DPOS model? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're following, you know, EOS, so they call it super nodes. We're getting super nodes. Um, we're also bringing the notion of we call them virtual nodes. So you know, again, we want we want this to be um, you know utilized and and as many stakeholders, if you call it for a better will, um, you know, and every you do, which is our token, that does control a an element of network resources. So the whole notion behind our virtual nodes is kind of like a master node um, that. Um, you can stake your your tokens, and your and the the bandwidth that your tokens control can be leased or rented to a DAP that needs more throughput to reach its end user experience. Yeah. So as you were saying, there's you know different DAPs require a different TPS. Um, you know, uh, and of course that will then directly you know correlate to how many tokens they're going to have to hold in order to guarantee a user experience. So, uh, so it's quite it's quite an innovative um, you know, approach. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to I wanted to kind of touch a little bit on the you do token as well because you br you brought it up. Um, I do I do like to ask what is the utility of the token on the platform and outside of the platform is there any incentive for, you know, investors to hold it and are there are there rewards? What what what, what can we do with the you do token? Yeah, so yeah, um, so yeah, I mean that's there's two answers to that question. Um, um, the, the first answer is from a usage standpoint. Yeah, so the the token, the lifeblood of the whole network, um, is going to be based on the you do. Yeah, so it's the medium of exchange. You know, um, so if you think about, um, you know, this is going to be a free service, so users don't have to pay to use the service. But if a, a user wants to take some premium content from a content creator. I give the example of, um, let's say that you've got a, um, a band, yeah, um, an up and coming band, and um, you know, they've got their channel on YouTube, and they're looking at ways of monetizing. We all know in those industries, it's very difficult unless you are at the very, very top, but there's millions of very good bands that never get to that level. But they still produce quality content with with a relatively large fan base. But you know, let's say you know they they send out a message to their their fan base to say next Tuesday from six till ten we're going to be um, putting on a private live stream jamming session, and it's going to cost you fifty you do's. Mm -hmm. So you know the users can then you know basically you know pay for the you do's. Um, if they see something, I always talk about like a charity, you know, can you imagine, you know, if there's, you know, um, a charity has their channel and they're doing a live stream of, um, you know, uh, digging um, um, or, you know, uh, providing sanitation in a village is somewhere third world country, you know, there's that custom intimacy where, um, shouldn't we call them customers, but, you know, intimacy with end users where they're, they're asking for donations, but, but the end user can, can actually see with their, with their own eyes, what, you know, where their money's going to. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and they, and they have the ability on the, on the how do app to actually throw them a tip. Yeah. We call it tipping, you know, microtransactions. Um, so you've, you, you've got that from the end user standpoint. Um, you've got the ability for channels to offer merchandising. Again, I talk about bands, but it, you know, it, it could, could be something else that uh, they have, they can, they can, you know, sell. So it's like an e-commerce element to it. From an advertiser standpoint, if they, when they come on and they want to run influencer campaigns or any other campaigns, that would all be transferred using you do. So they will have to hold you do's in order to run marketing campaigns. So um, anything, anything to do with the, um, with the social layer will require a you do. Okay. Um, now, you asked the other question, which is 
quite sensitive because you know we we don't want to get in trouble with any yeah, yeah. regulatory um, you know uh, organization. But the point here is is that um, uh, why would someone this, I don't want to call it investment, but why would someone be motivated to um, buy a Udo be- before the whole service is launched? Because of course they 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 won't be able to use it because you know it's 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 down the line. Well, then it really comes down to the notions of um, uh, if you're a super node, then you're going to have to hold Udo's. It's part, part will be part of the application process you have to go through, but. More talking about end users, uh, this whole concept about virtual nodes. Um, they have the ability to uh, buy a Udo, which controls an, a percentage of the resources on the network in, antas- in, in, in anticipation of a future demand that's coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's it's, it's quite exciting when you start actually brainstorming it. We did release a, an economic white paper, which I can actually send you if you might want to put a link on that people can have a look at. Yeah. Read did. slightly more about um, the whole economics regarding super nodes, but virtual nodes, um, as well as. The, you, the actual utility of the token, which will be for the you know users, content creators, and advertisers. Yeah, we could definitely do that. Just uh, send me a link when we're done, and I'll drop it in the description. And that, cool. that would actually be a really great read for everybody. So I guess my biggest question also is, we've talked about the use case of the token and how everyone can use it on the network, but what about you guys? I mean, how do you guys make money? You're obviously not going to do all this for free, right? So, sure. So how does how do itself actually make money? Yeah, sure. So, again, being a being a social layer, social network, uh, the big revenue stream is going to be coming through from advertising. Yeah, I mean, it is. If you if you look at the uh, the successful business models, um, especially in our space, you know, it's all driven by um, advertising. You know, f- filling up the um, the top of the funnel. Um, you know, however, you know there are there are other areas that we're also looking at developing. So we will be taking you know very small transaction fees. Um, if a band wants to, as I say, release some you know, premium content, we, we will be taking small amounts of, of fees from there. Um, but again, it's how we distribute those as well. So you know what we're saying is is that sixty um, percent of the revenues that the whole network. Um, generates will be passed back into the ecosystem. You'll call it a better word, and then you know we will retain forty percent of that because it's going to be expensive. You know, as I said, um, the you know we will be releasing a public blockchain, which is one thing, but we're also running off chain, which that will still be decentralized, but we have to pay for that. Um, so, you know, there, there has to be a realization that we are looking um, to be a very profitable organization, but in a more democratic environment where other people earn um, off of their own actions rather than one central organization basically um, soaking up as much revenue as they can. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And as far as what you guys are doing, kind of just to talk about, you do have an upcoming token sale happening. Um, now these are going to be. You're, are you going to be distributing ERC twenties? Are they placeholders? For okay, so they're yeah. pla- so they're placeholders. So then my question is, when are you guys actually? When do you think you're going to have the main net launched, or when is your goal to have the main net launched by? So we're you know we're currently planning to have our um, you know test net launched around September, um, and we will be looking you know subject to that going very very well either at the back end of the of the year or very early next year. The main net. Um, uh, we will really be following the same um, the same footsteps as EOS, you know, with what they've done. So at the right time, you know, making people very aware that we take a snapshot and doing a one for one, you know, conversion. Um, you know, they've proven that, that that's how it works. We there's, there's no there's no need to innovate something that's that you know is working very very well. So you know, uh, we are we've, we're just finishing today our pre sale. We're going into just a um, a ten day um, token sale. Um, you know, again, you know, we're not looking at raising huge amounts of money. We're looking at raising a relatively modest amount of money. You know, eight point seven million, which, relatively speaking, in the blockchain world, is very very small. Eight point seven million. Yes. But wow, that's a, that's actually very very modest. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, 
But in the in in the old world, let's call it, you know, with VCs, et cetera, et cetera, you know, um, that is actually a large amount of money, um, uh, you know, before you've actually released your final solution. So, you know, it's, you know, we're trying to blend the best, you know, the best of both worlds. Um, uh, we believe that we can demonstrate to the to the community that we can really um, support our um, objectives um, um, by releasing our main net, proving the scalability, proving the user experience. And then I believe that the true value of how do will be realized. Um, that makes more sense to me. It also, as an individual, um, it, it sits better with me that we're only raising a smaller amount. Um, whereas, you know, if we are raising a huge amount, you've always, you know, you've always got that extra heavy load of knowing that, you know, you have raised a huge huge amount of money, huge amount of expectation. Um, and really, what are you going to be doing with it? You know, that's that's a philosophical, perhaps another another interview. Yeah, um, yeah. That well, you might um, want to have with a few of us. Well, I'm not I mean, I don't mean to, to kind of point the fingers, but um, there have been some in the past that have raised ungodly amounts and literally just abandoned the project. And we're just like, hey, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of people kind of caught on to that. <laughs> and, you know, so when you see something like with a modest sale, like what you're doing, that's really awesome as well. Um, but okay, so let's get back on just, you know, before we kind of wrap everything up, let's get back to the actual uh, platform social uh, social experience itself, because that's really why we're here. Yeah. So what have you guys, do you have a strategy? What is your plan to actually onboard the everyday user? Like how, how do you plan on convincing somebody who's like a diehard, you know, standard traditional uh, social network user to come on to how do? Sure. Yeah. No. No. I, I get you. And and again, th this conversation could go on for hours just on that topic. But you know, I'm going to break it down into really two areas. So if you think about it, we we are releasing an ecosystem. Okay. So we've got a social layer. It's called How Do, uh, and and we ourselves want want users to come on, content creators and advertisers, and to build that. But because we're a public blockchain as well, we're looking for um, specific DApps to come on. That can also add value that requires a social layer. Okay, so you know we're we're trying to like meet it from um, both ends. They'll go to market plan. Um, in relation to um, getting into the details, and that is, and if you look at some of the partners that we've signed up with now and, and we're talking to, it's all about identifying niches, um, making sure that you find a partner that is a gateway to a niche, whether it's at the front end of becoming a social partner, or it's actually everything where um, the partners decided that they need mass scale, low latency. So they want to take advantage of our blockchain as well as partner with us in the social layer. Um, but it's all about niches. You know, we go after one niche after another niche. Um, yeah, we've recently signed with um, the world's largest cosplay, oh. you know, agency platform called Cure. Um, you know, uh, not you know. Some people know about cosplay, other people don't. But it's you know, it is about a nineteen billion dollar yeah. global industry. Yeah, no, it's big. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't do it personally, but I know, I know people that do participate in it, and it's a, it's a big thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I well, it, it's quite funny. I've, I've, I've had to agree that the next time I'm, I'm in Tokyo, I will record a live AMA. Um, dressed up in my cosplay outfit, so uh, oh, nice, nice. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you which one it is at a later day. But um, yes, it's it's a it's a niche. It's it's a very loyal niche, very motivated niche, and it's growing like wildfire across the world. Um, and um, you know, so we have teamed up with uh, Cure. Um, they'll be taking advantage of our of our social layer, enabling their cosplayers, which I think they've got like um, uh, seven hundred. 20,000, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. It's huge. I need, to, lot, I, need yeah. to check, I need to check their details, but um, they've got about, I think, about four or five million followers, etc. cetera. Um, but ena enabling their, their top cosplayers to set up channels and monetize themselves because, yeah, it's very difficult for a cosplayer to, to be able to monetize. Um, we are also in, in, you know, in, in talks with other partners. We have um, Drophead Games. Um, it's a, a local um, um, games um, developer, very innovative. Uh, and in fact, um, only last week they did they did 
confirmed that they will be developing their be our first app um, on our platform as well because oh. they are you know they are about six to nine months away from developing their their platform so that would be the right timing you know for us to have our main net out so they can actually um, deploy uh, we've got things like Autobay which is a uh, an up-and-coming blockchain company that is is working with different car manufacturers mm -hmm. you know so you have you know niches of you know whether it's BMWs or Ferraris or in the crypto world everyone likes to talk about Lamborghinis or you know whatever it is um, again you know utilizing our social layer um, to you know, enable um, you know them to have a greater you know outreach and you know end user intimacy with their with their target so we, we are selectively going around signing up with niche or, or with partners that have gateways to niches and that's really our main go-to-market strategy which works at the front end as well as the back end because ultimately we don't want to we don't want to onboard a third party that's developing a dap that really doesn't share the same um philosophy in uh, or use user requirements of mass scale low latency um, on our network yeah I mean we we, we want to make sure there's like-minded uh, the ecosystem is made up of like-minded entities or users yeah I think starting with communities is a great a great great place to start because you know once they get you know for example they have a certain uh, I don't know really had a, uh, a superstar or somebody that they really look up to and they get on the platform and then usually the whole kind of herd follows out on, on top of that as well. I mean, even just jokingly, I don't know if you remember back in the MySpace days, you know, that was like kind of like the haven for like all the emo kids listening to music, you know, teen angst and all that. So I really like that. You're kind of reaching out to all these different niches and you're showing them the power and the advantages of the platform. That's a, that's yeah. a great strategy. Yeah. And then, and then of course, you know, I think once people get onto the platform, they will then start realizing that you know, they can actually derive some some value from this. Yeah, they they can monetize themselves if they want. You know, um, you know the big dream is everyone wants to become you know a YouTube star, but the, but the reality is it's very very difficult for for you know a youngster or anyone that really that that could ever make any money out of that. You know, where and you know, it's uh hope, it's a lot more work than people think. I'll tell you that, man. They 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 only see the twenty minute video come out. They don't see the ten hours that go into working behind the scenes. Just gonna throw that out there. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then and then you add the extra complexity of the bureaucratic nature of the policies that these centralized players have, you know, even little little things, namely, yes, you you own your content, Carl. You know, the T's and C's of YouTube says that you own it. But it also says that, you know, you give them exclusive global rights to do whatever they want with it. You know, oh, it's, yeah. And, and, it, and it's those little tweaks that are very difficult to articulate that um, in a marketing campaign. But, you know, our hope is that once we work with our partners to bring on niches, then they start realizing that there's so much more power in the platform. They can monetize themselves. They can, if they get up to 500 viewers, they can then start being included into nano influencing campaigns. Um, you know, once we once the advertisers realise that they can run a multi-million um, uh, user target campaign through nano influencers, and it's organised and it's smooth and it's clean, I think that's when the how do platform will just explode. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to articulate that until someone has tasted it. You know, so it's. Yeah, it's uh, it's like a multi-level uh, go-to-market, really. It's also difficult to envision something, you know, when you're when you're speaking about it. Like I like I, one way, once I can hold it, look at it, you know, interact. I think that's where the real value will come, and that's what you guys are working towards in in in, uh, in what you're doing with your roadmap and the whole EOS and everything. I mean, like I said, when we first spoke, I almost feel like it's not like it's a different project. The vision has stayed the same. But I'm unbelievably impressed with how far you guys have taken it just from an idea to an actual, you know, implemented service. I have to say, I, 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 you guys have definitely been working hard on it. I can vouch for that. So, yeah. um, I mean, as far as the, as far as this goes, we've covered so much today. Um, we, we definitely dove in a lot deeper. It's funny because we talked so much tech today, but that was really <laughs> awesome. It's awesome because I, I like to hear that. I like to know that you guys are actually looking at it, you know, not just like, you know, here's our flashy billboard and, you know, come buy our tokens. So I guess before we go, is there anything that you kind of want to leave my viewers with? Any last, uh, just 
anything you want to leave us with before we go? Um, no, uh, it, yeah, perhaps the, you know, the rhetorical question, you know, and that is, you know, when you're looking into participate in a token sale or, or you're looking at the landscape of all these glitzy marketing campaigns of people, you know, statements, you know, it's, you know, to you know, always remember that, you know, is it ever going to deliver on its promise in order to fulfill its business model? You know, and I, you know, I think that's, you know, uh, unless you've been around in business for some time, um, sometimes you lose that kind of focus that at the end of the day, it's all well and good having a glitzy website, fantastic advisors, um, even VC backers, you know, um, you know, you know, big YouTube endorsers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's all well and good. But if you haven't worked out that the whole environment is going to scale to a level that you can deliver, then, yeah, it's yeah. Empty, you know, it's an empty promise, unfortunately. And um, so, we, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're trying to come in from a different way. You know, we've spoken about it today and, you know, and um, I look forward to you know, providing you other updates when we have, you know, launched. We've, we've got Alpha, so people can go to the Play Store. It's only on Android at the moment and download the How Do app. Uh, which gives them a flavor on the social, you know, experience. Uh, but I'm really excited you know, when we've spun up and we've made it public, our test net, and that we can get independent people in to verify our transactions per second, you know, and, you know, no baloney, just be facts. And that's what I'm really looking forward to. So uh, hopefully you'll have me back in uh, in a few months. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'd love to do an update video. That would be great because then you can see the progress and see the um – you know, hitting those milestones. I, I think that's a great idea. I might even reach out to more people to do that as well. Um, and yeah, so for everybody out there that's watching, definitely check out How Do, um, the app. You can you can kind of test it out, see how you feel about it. The you know EOS fork is coming up soon. A lot of big things. DApps are going to be run on top of it. They're reaching out to communities already. So guys, if you want, check it out. How Do and David, thank you so much for coming back to my channel. I or actually coming to my channel for the first time. I really appreciate it. So um, with that being said, guys, my name is K-Dub. This is Crypto Zombie. Until next time, stay crypto and peace out. Cheers.